Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the historic Brennan Courthouse. Before we get started with our ceremony, at this time, I would like to ask the Judiciary Voices in Unity to please come out, and I would ask you all to remain standing for the singing of the National Anthem. Tired the colors. Please be seated. Since we have a very wonderful and somewhat lengthy program, my comments will remain very short. So at this time, it is my privilege to introduce the leader of the third branch of government, the judiciary in the state of New Jersey, Chief Justice Stuart Ravner, who will now take over the ceremonies. Thank you, Judge Marie. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. And I don't know if the voices in unity are still close enough to hear, but you, you enhance every program you participate in. Aren't they magnificent? <laughs> We're here today, of course, to honor and celebrate the life and career of Justice Marie Garibaldi. And part of that tribute will include a presentation of a portrait and the dedication of a courtroom in this majestic courthouse that was so dear to her. 
On behalf of the members of the Supreme Court, we are all delighted to welcome family, friends, former law clerks, professional colleagues, and partners in public service from throughout her life. A special welcome to and from the members of the Supreme Court who are here in force today. I know that Governor and Ruthie Byrne were planning to be here, so I'll welcome them and hope that they're able to arrive and wish the governor a happy birthday. To Chief Justice Azali, who leads a distinguished group of former justices and judges who are here today. Uh, to Judges Grant and Massano, who lead an equally distinguished group of judges who are currently on the bench. Commissioner Badalato, former Attorney General Harvey, Mayor Turner, Sheriff Shalari, leaders and members of the Hudson County Bar Association and Bar Foundation, and of the Garibaldi Inn of Court, representatives of the Hackensack University Health Network, an organization that the justice was intimately involved with throughout her life, and our distinguished speakers, whom I will speak about and introduce during the course of the program, welcome, one and all. Justice Garibaldi was appointed to the Supreme Court by Governor Tom Kane in 1982. She received her law degree from Columbia, an LLM in tax from NYU, before embarking on an impressive career in private practice, and immediately before joining the court, she served as a partner at the law firm Riker Danzig. Now, if you think about those sterling credentials from the perspective of 2017, you can lose sight of what a trailblazer the justice was. As we know, she was the first woman to serve on the highest court of the state and also the first woman to serve as president of the Bar Association of the State. In 2000, Chief Justice Poritz, who had planned to be here and because of a family commitment changed her plans in the last moment and sends her regrets, eloquently noted that Justice Garibaldi, quote, bore the burden of being the first with grace and style. She met the incidental demands of being the first woman on the court, the first woman to head the bar, without sacrificing the quality of her performance in either role. She understood that being first was important and that she had become a role model for others, but she knew that above all else, the quality of her work mattered, that quality was a critical requirement if there was ever to be a second. She was she is a lady of substance, of quality. Now, during her more than 17 years on the bench, the justice authored more than 225 opinions. Her decisions in Toys R Us and Frank versus the Ivy Club, to name but two, elevated the discussion and provided important guidance on discrimination in the workplace and in our society. And the justice also championed complementary dispute resolution the Inn of Court that is named for her recognizes her leadership in the CDR movement and also continues to foster that in a very practical way. Throughout her time on the bench and her legal career as a whole, Justice Garibaldi was known for her direct, thoughtful, and concise and clear guidance that she provided to judges and practitioners alike. But we shouldn't lose sight of her unique style in doing all of that. Here's an example from a letter that she wrote to her colleagues on the court in December of 1992. To my dear colleagues, Santa Claus and I seriously conferred about an appropriate Christmas Hanukkah gift for you. Santa suggested Rolex watches and an evening for two at the Rainbow Room. But I assured Santa that such ostentatious gifts would not be favorably received by such an intellectual group of individuals. On learning of your great interest in legal matters, Santa suggested perhaps a legal book would be appropriate for such a distinguished group of scholars. As soon as Santa mentioned a book, being my modest, unassuming self, I immediately knew what the perfect gift would be. Indeed, I wondered how it had ever escaped me. Accordingly, I am enclosing the perfect Garibaldi gift from me to you, a present of my article the New Jersey experience accommodating the separation between the legislature and the judiciary, <laughs> which appeared in volume 23, 1992 of the Seton Hall Law Review. Happy holidays to all. Love, Marie. <laughs> and the letter ends with this postscript. P.S. There will be a short quiz on the article at our December 8th conference. 
Now, fortunately for us, our next speaker was present for that, con that conference and no doubt has a crystal clear recollection of the discussion that took place. It is a delight to call upon retired Associate Justice Stuart Pollack, a dear friend and former colleague of the Justice. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Uh, I've been given five minutes to talk about Marie's 18 years on the Supreme Court, uh, years in which we attended oral arguments, where we participated in conferences, generally agreeing, sometimes disagreeing, and generally sharing the ups and downs of life on an appellate court. Let's start at the beginning. Uh, Marie Louise Garibaldi took her oath of office on November 17, 1982, nearly 35 years ago. And until she arrived on the court, it had considered and been con uh, constituted solely of white males. And those of us who knew Marie, particularly those of us who had worked with her, were delighted with the appointment. As Marie said at the time, they were gentlemen when I arrived on the court, and they were gentlemen thereafter. So what was it like to be Justice Garibaldi's colleague? And maybe a story will help. Uh, a little known fact about the Supreme Court courtroom is that it has, for the seven justices, it has six sets of benches, of drawers. This means that the newest member of the court shares a drawer or a set of drawers with another member. When Marie arrived on the court, uh, that was me. So we sat next to each other. Now there was a good deal of curiosity about how it was working out on this previously all-male bastion, and the media and the bar uh, had lots of questions. And I remember going to a bar meeting where one of the lawyers said, look, uh, how's it working out with the, with the woman on the court? And I said, it's wonderful. She's a delight. In fact, we share the same set of drawers. <laughs> he, he, he just shook his head and walked away. <laughs> uh, since then, uh, the court has been blessed with several distinguished female justices. The chief mentioned uh, Chief Justice Ports, but there is Justice Lavecchia, Justice Long, Justice Patterson, Justice Holmes, uh, all of whom have graced the court with their presence. My guess is that each of them would acknowledge that her path to the court was smooth because Marie did so well while she was on the court. As a lawyer in justice, Marie Garibaldi was a role model for aspiring lawyers, especially women. And witness the two opinions that Chief Justice Ravner mentioned. Uh, Lehman versus Toys R Us, which set forth the definition of sexual harassment in the workplace, or Frank versus Ivy, uh, Ivy Club, which uh, told Princeton and the eating clubs there that they could not ban women simply because they were women. In both her personal and professional lives, Marie conducted herself so that others wanted to treat her with respect and trust and friendship. As a colleague, she was a delight. She promptly uh, circulated the opinions that had been assigned to her. She did the same thing with her separate opinions. And she was often the first to complete the filing of her opinions at the end of a term. Her opinions, as the Chief Justice mentioned, were like Marie herself. They were clear, concise, and direct. Marie had no time in her life for pettiness. One other story, and then I'll close within my uh, allocated uh, five minutes. Uh, every year, 
Marie would send a birthday card to each of the justices. In my case, the, the cards were hilarious, and they, they generally had two themes. One, I was growing older, and two, she was still younger than me. <laughs> and last December, for the first time, no card arrived, and I missed that card, and even more, I miss Marie. And it's good to know that future generations will be able to look at her portrait and remember the first woman to serve as president of the New Jersey State Bar Association and as a justice on the Supreme Court. I hope they also remember the dignity, dedication, and competence that she brought to those positions and the <coughs> respect, trust, and love that she inspired in her colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. In a statement that Justice Garibaldi issued in 1999 when she announced that she was to retire in a month, she wrote, although justices have few perks, we do have the best and brightest helpers to assist us, albeit only for a year. One of the joys of being a justice has been the assistance and the affection of my clerks. My clerks have been outstanding young men and women who, with their families, have become part of my extended family." End quote. We have the privilege today to hear from three former gifted law clerks to the justice, starting with Judge Jack Sabatino of the Appellate Division, who still represents the best and the brightest. Jack. Thank you very much, uh, Chief. Uh, members of the court, past and present, my fellow jurists, Hudson County, Judge Bariso, and my appellate colleagues and other judges in the room, members of the political branches, Congressman Guarini, so nice to see you again, and uh, members of the bar, members of the legal academy, family and friends, and devoted members of the MLG fan club. I'm glad to be here at this historic and special event for a very historic and special person. I was chronologically the first of Justice Garibaldi's 46 law clerks, many of whom are seated over there. Um, but every one of us was treated like her as the first. Something unique and special about all of us. And I've been asked today to talk about the justice briefly as mentor. So about 100 years ago, Justice John Crawford Crosby of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, the equivalent of our Supreme Court, said this, mentoring is a brain to pick, an ear to listen, and a push in the right direction. And that all applies to our dear mentor, Justice Garibaldi. I'm gonna spend a few minutes dividing my examples of this between our mentoring when we were her law clerks and the mentoring that occurred afterwards for many, many years. So, I indeed was with Justice Garibaldi on her very first day of work as a justice in the old Mutual Benefit Life Building, some of you remember that, on Broad Street in Newark. Uh, Justice Schreiber was around the corner on the same floor. Justice Coleman from the Appellate Division was nearby. And together, along with our, her secretary, Marlene, uh, she energetically began going through the boxes of files and cases that were going to be part of the upcoming docket. And what looked like a lot of work to me, the justice was unpacking like Christmas presents. She was just so excited about the work that lie ahead. And she, she dove into that work very diligently and efficiently, and Chief absolutely right, with quality. And we were all guided and mentored by her example in that. She was always in chambers and otherwise upbeat and positive. 
I wasn't always that way. And one day, I'm in chambers, and I'm trying to figure out some research on a fraud case. And it involved some properties in this area and various partnerships and corporations and transfers of assets back and forth, a whole twisted series of transactions. And I guess I looked pretty glum. I was trying to diagram it. And she walked by my desk and said, Jack, you look like you're unhappy. I said, well, actually, Justice, I, I, I really, I'm having trouble making sense of all this. And she looked at it for a minute. She said, well, Jack, don't be upset. It's a Hudson County scheme. <laughs> it's not supposed to make any sense. We learned a lot from her about Hudson County, didn't we? Joe Guarino, by the way, Joe, who's from Hudson County, among all the clerks, uh, has done so much work. And Joe, we'll, we'll talk about it later, but we want to all acknowledge how much you have done with our group to have this occasion today. Um, so yes, she was practical, down to earth, common sense, the brain to pick. 225 opinions, always written, handwritten. Nice penmanship, very clear, direct prose. She also taught us in working on those cases how the law could impact everyday real life, the litigants, the people out there who would have to be guided by those rules of law. Um, there was an event the first year that she invited us to. At that point, my co-clerk, Wendy Hart, had arrived, and she always was trying to include us in things. So we, we went along. It was over at the Newark Club, and uh, the tax section, where's Judge Delmida? tax section of the state bar decided to, she had been a tax lawyer, to organize an event, get this, with the first two female justices. So Sandra Day O'Connor came up from Washington and Justice Garibaldi came as the first female justice from New Jersey and there was this meet and greet event and, and it was very nice, you know, the tax section being real social animals, of course, it was a real <laughs> outgoing event. And I was watching Justice Garibaldi in the room and she was working the room. I don't know if you learned that in Hudson County. She was shaking hands with everybody, having a grand old time. And Justice O'Connor was very impressive, but she was demure, she was on the sidelines, and she gave a talk, and Justice Garibaldi gave a talk, and I said, man, I am so lucky. My mentor is the rock star in this room, <laughs> with all due respect. Um, now, that continued after the clerkship. She remained very much part of our lives. We remained part of her lives. Uh, there was the annual Christmas card. There was the inevitable birthday card. We had um, uh, this dinner, which became known as the Garibaldi Fest, where uh, most of the clerks would get together either in New York and, uh, or New Jersey and, and have a lovely meal with her. And she'd sit down and she talked to us about what was going on in our lives and our children and our careers. She was always available, always available to us to give us sound advice on career issues and other things that we were struggling with. Yes, she was the ear to listen to, Judge Crosby. She did treat us like being part of her own family, and, and we felt the same way. Um, she also was very clear about us always looking the part, right? She always herself was impeccably dressed, not a hair out of place, and you'll see that in just a minute when they unveil this. She was always very, um, uh, classy in every in way and, and an inspiration to us all. She admired and loved us, and we admired and loved her. And we always will. Our mentor. Well said. Thank you, Judge. United States District Judge Madeline Cox Arleo served as a law clerk for the 1989-1990 term, and we are so pleased to hear from her next. Sorry, Chief, I sat in the wrong section of the room. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, friends and family of our beloved Justice Marie. I am Madeline Cox Arleo. And I am one of the older siblings, not as old as Jack, but one of the older siblings in the Garibaldi Law Clerk family, and I had the privilege of serving as her law clerk. I was asked to speak about Justice Marie as icon and inspiration in five minutes. 
an, impo an impossible task for anyone, but especially for me. I don't know where to begin except to say that none of us are faithful clerks would be the people, lawyers, or judges we are today without her influence and inspiration. She inspired us because of her wisdom, not just reflected in her written opinions, but instead the beloved Justice Marie beneath the robes and behind the scenes, the wise jurist who lived the premise that wisdom and compassion are indivisible, who taught us as new lawyers to respect intelligence but to respect kindness more, to follow her lead in being respectful and generous, to understand that practicing law is a privilege and that the practice of law should always be honorable. We learned over time that what inspired us was this innate sense of goodness which made her wisdom so much more powerful and lasting. She inspired us because although she was so busy, she always found time for each of us and did so for years and years. As we grew up and went on with our lives, she was always there to listen and offer advice about a new law firm, a teaching opportunity, or even a judgeship. She was protective of each of us, as if we were her own gently guiding us where she knew we should go, even if we hadn't figured it out yet. She made each of us feel special, simply because we had become part of the extended Garibaldi family and she had become part of ours. She celebrated our victories and mourned our losses. She cared about our significant others, our mothers, our fathers, and our children. As a law clerk, she listened patiently to my story of my first date with my now husband, Frank. But she was not impressed when I told her that when we got back to my house, I popped in the VCR she had given me of her interview with Justice Brennan that spring in Washington, D.C. She told me that I would never hear from that guy again. <laughs> she was wrong on that one. She came to my all-female 50th birthday party given by my husband and gave me the most cherished gift, her judicial robe. Every time I put it on, it is a reminder of the kind of judge I strive to be. She inspired us because of her loyalty. The greatest benefit of a Garibaldi clerkship was the security of knowing that you had the justice in your corner, no matter where your path had taken you in life. Whether you stayed in Hudson County, which she preferred, or ventured to far parts of the world, whether you were a liberal or a conservative, whether you rarely came to the annual clerks gathering, Garibaldi Fest, or never missed one. She had you back. It was important to her that we, her clerks, became friends with each other. She would invite us to different events with different clerks so that we would become friends, which was her plan, and of course the plan worked. She remembered each of our birthdays, and we all looked forward to that birthday card and the handwritten note by Justice Marie. She inspired us by her loyalty, which only grew stronger as the years went by. She inspired us by her joyfulness. She taught us the importance of living life to the fullest and making the most of every day. She entertained us with stories of her travels around the world with her mother, the beloved General. Garibaldi Fest was a great event because she was the center of it. In between, she shared happy times with us at the Breakers in Spring Lake, at her Montclair Club, at law school and bar association dinners, Italian-American society galas, which I had the privilege of attending once because of my husband, parties at the MoMA, and wherever else fun could be had. When my children were small, she invited us to the breakers for lunch at the pool. I remember learning that, like a doting grandmother, she had been at the table since early that morning because she wanted to make sure that her beloved Peter and Alexandra had the best for you. She was a joy to be around. She was always optimistic and happy. She never missed an opportunity to be with each of us. I know that she is with us here at this grand celebration today in her beloved courthouse that bears the name of her friend, Justice Brennan, surrounded by her clerks, fellow justices, lawyers, friends, and family, all of whom she loved so deeply. She inspired us by her goodness. Her goodness was reflected in her character, her integrity, her honesty, her kindness, her generosity, and moral courage. We saw, it in how, we saw it in how she treated others, from her fellow justices to the cleaning staff. We heard it when she spoke her mind on issues of importance and realized 
that what she said was always fair and just. Justice Murray was the embodiment of all these characteristics of true goodness. Her goodness came from her unshakable faith in God and the gift of seeing the best in everyone. Justice Garibaldi's icon status reaches far beyond the courts, the bar, the Catholic Church, the fine university she attended, and the numerous charities she supported. We are here today to celebrate her wisdom, her loyalty, her joyfulness, her goodness, and her friendship. She made us not only better lawyers, but better friends, spouses, daughters and sons, mothers and fathers. For her clerks, she was truly our judicial mother. She made us all better people because we knew her, and that is why she continues to inspire us. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Frank. I had no idea that you were such a Justice Brennan fan, but I think we understand why. Our next speaker did not clerk for Justice Garibaldi, and yet somehow had a remarkable career nonetheless. <laughs> Congressman Frank Guarini is not only a dear friend of the justice, but also a champion of the judiciary here in Hudson. And there will be much more to say about his generosity in that regard, hopefully in the very near future. Congressman, we are honored to welcome you here today. Thank you very much, Justice. My voice isn't very strong today, so you'll have to forgive me. As much has been said about Marie Garibaldi, and she was one of my dear personal friends, and she's a colleague, and she's a member of many clubs that I have been a member of, and we have worked together on the extracurricular activities. And I go back knowing her a long, long time. Not from the beginning, I was just talking with a dear friend of mine, and we talked about the fact that a lot of people may not know that Marie Garibaldi was born with a heart defect and she was one of the earliest heart operations. Her father was a doctor and they picked it up when she was born and she started out with that, that liability in life which she overcome to become a great woman and a legend. She had a heart defect in valve, which was corrected, one of the first operations of its kind. I don't know if that really says anything except the fact that we were, most of us, a lot luckier than her when she started. And today, she's become a legend. I guess the rain outside would be the tears of happiness that she's shedding, knowing that she's being honored here in this lovely courthouse. I remember one time I was at a meeting of the Italian American uh, NIAF, the national organization, some of you may know of it. Uh, it's nationwide and it's also in Italy. And it was Pavarotti's birthday, Luciano Pavarotti, the famous tenor. And we were both officers of that association. So Pavarotti sat with us and we had entertainment for him and there was three tenors that sang. And when the tenor hit a high note, I leaned over to Pavarotti and I said, it is marvelous the way he hit that note. And Parabere turned over to me, and he waved his finger, and he said, it's not how he hit the note alone, it's how he got there. And when you think of it, how did Marie get to where she is today? Not by campaigning, not by running for office, not by getting active in organizations that she was asking people to elect her to a position. I was on many organizations with her. She never asked, people came to her. She was a born leader in her way because she was so thorough, loved people, trusted people. They liked, they trusted her. She was a wonderful, warm personality and she was big. She had a sensitivity about people 
she understood life, and she was a person who was close to everybody in this courtroom. In this courthouse here, where she had her office upstairs, she used to come in here earlier than the other people who worked here. She came here with the people who opened the door, and she, and she worked, and she respected them, and she conversed with them, and they felt like she was part of them. And her feeling toward people outside in the office, in the court, was all, always the same, that there was a deep sensitivity of people, their feelings, their needs, their wants, and she responded to that. And I think this is what makes her different. She didn't run in all, all the organizations that I know. She didn't really come up to anybody and say, please elect me. People went to her and asked her because she was so sensitive and she was so interested in them and she was so knowledgeable about life. So I think she was one of the most remarkable women that I ever met. And she's a legend in her times. And you know, I remember in, um, the interest that she had in her ethnicity. Uh, she was an Italian American. Now she may not have been the greatest cook, but she <laughs> liked Italian food. And she was an Italian American. And she was so proud of the history and the, and the culture and the traditions of Italy that she participated locally and she dissipated statewide, and she anticipated nationalwide, and she used to go to Italy a great deal. A great deal with some of the people at John Kemi University that I'm associated with, and we've been on the same board together. And uh, she, she was an exceptional individual. In fact, one of the people, Bob Del Tufo, you may know, who was one of our attorney generals of New Jersey, died about a year or so ago around the same time Marie did, et cetera. They were both on the board, and this, which we had to replace. Rosemary Alito was one of the people that are up with us. And we all felt deeply about uh, Italy as a culture, as a, con as a nation, not from a political science viewpoint, but from what it meant. And, you know, she felt that way about the Knights of Malta. She was a Roman Catholic. And she was one of the highest elected officials in the North American uh, registry of uh, the Knights of Malta. And as you remember, some of those of you who had been at the, uh, at the church uh, ceremony uh, that uh, from the people that appeared in the medieval dresses and gowns, et cetera, they came and they were, uh, and that was one of the most noble uh, associations of the Catholic Church that we have. She was proud of her religion. She was proud of who she was and what she was. And she felt that way about everybody else. In fact, is that what makes America so great? That all of us believe in what our ethnicity is and we respect the ethnicity of everyone else. And we can take the best of that particular ethnicity and discard the least and we borrow from each other, and we learn from one another and in different nationalities and different ethnicities, and we grow what is called the American, the American dream, which is what our Constitution stands for. So Marie was that great American, and we honor her. She leaves a legacy that we will not forget, and a woman that has left a, a path for other people to follow. And she always said very often, you know, if all of us made just a little bit of difference, we do just a little bit of good, if everyone did that, what a great world we would live in. And it's very, very true. So Marie, we salute you. You were a great lady. Your memory will be kept always. You are a legend. God bless you. Look down on us, our thoughts, our prayers, our wishes are with you. Thank you.
Thank you, Congressman, and please know that we salute you as well. Thank you for those beautiful words. We will hear now from Carol Corbin Walker, another dynamic former State Bar President. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I've been asked to speak with respect to Justice Marie Garibaldi as a faithful friend. And in doing that, I was also asked to talk to some other individuals about their relationship with Marie as a faithful friend and also their experiences with her in the Order of Malta. I see Agatha and Bob Bosaniker, who also are in the Order of Malta along with Sufini, but um, Bob and Agatha shared some wonderful memories with me, and I'll share some of them with you in my five minutes. And I asked my husband back there, Paul Walker, to put up the finger when I'm almost for like four minutes, and I don't want to go over time, because I have the chief over here, I have AJ over here, I have justices, judges all around. And also, Bob and Karen Tanzola, who are both in the Order of Malta. Karen is um, Justice, was Justice Marie um, Garibaldi's cousin. They're in Florida now, but I spoke to both of them. When you talk about a faithful friend, Webster defines faithful, constant, devoted, loyal. And a friend is someone whom you know, you like, and you trust. That was Justice Marie Garibaldi. In the Bible, Sirach, chapter 6, verse 14, a faithful friend is a steady shelter. Although in the original text it says he, today it will be she, who has found one, has found a treasure. Justice Garibaldi was indeed a treasure to many. Agatha met Justice Garibaldi when they both worked for the Internal Revenue Service in 1960. They were dear friends until the Justice's passing. Justice Garibaldi was the maid of honor at Bob and Agatha's wedding, and she was the godmother of their oldest daughter, who is now 54 years old. The Justice never missed their daughter's birthday with a card, when she got married, anniversary cards, but that's everything that you've heard about earlier. The Justice was a devout Catholic. She was faithful, but she never wore her religion on her sleeve, and she never touted that fact, and she didn't have to but you know that she was a faithful, God-fearing person by her actions, which spoke louder than her words. She had a quiet resolve about her, and although she was quietly pushing women behind the scenes constantly, she was powerful, but in a way that was soft, gentle, but very powerful. I can't remember when I first met the Justice, but we shared our beloved Hudson County. Madeline, Hudson County, the Justice Hudson County, many of you all here are Hudson County. And the Bar Association is something that we also shared. She asked me one time, Carol, are you a Catholic? I'm like, yes, Justice, I am. And I was becoming president of the bar. She said, I would like you to consider becoming part of the Order of Malta. And some of you may not know what the Order of Malta is, but the Order of Malta is a lay religious order of the Roman Catholic faith. The men are called knights, the women are called dames. And I told her I would consider it once I finished my presidency year. That's 2003 to 2004. She asked me this about 2003, 2002. It had to have been the day after the annual meeting when I gave the baton to Ed McCready. I get a call from her. She said, okay, Carol, now's the time. I'm like, Justice, but I'm, I'm still an officer. I said, I need to pass president. No, nope. you finished being president. Got to do it now. 
And it's something that you have to do, not because someone asked you, but because you were taking it seriously, that you are committing for the rest of your life when you take the oath at St. Pat's Cathedral after a year of preparation, that you will help the sick and the poor and defend the Catholic faith. I see the one finger up, I'm getting ready to finish now. Just defend the Catholic faith for the rest of your life. She not only sponsored me, she sponsored Agatha, she sponsored Karen Tanzola, she sponsored so many people. She was like a membership committee of one, but again, a very powerful one. So she says, okay, Carol, you're in now. Also had to go to Lord's Friends. 2010 was the last time she went to Lord's Friends during the annual pilgrimage. And that was my first time. And that was a very meaningful trip because it culminated our relationship with respect to the order. And I told her then, and I have committed ever since then, to continue to go to Lord's every year, and I have consistently as long as God gives me the breath to continue that work that she so generously exposed me to. But that wasn't enough for her. She said, okay, now you have to run for the Board of Counselors. I'm like, but Justice, I, I have this, I have that. Nope, you're running. She was secretary of the board. I became a counselor on the Board of Counselors. And the day that she passed was the day I was elected in a contested election, secretary of the Board of Counselors of the Order of Malta. So for me, that was a cap for my faithful friend. And again, it was closure because I know that she's up there enjoying everything that everyone is doing and saying for her because her legacy lives in each and every one of us. And there are so many people whose lives she's touched, but she will live forever and all. God speak to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Joseph Guarino, another of the Justice's former law clerks, has the privilege of presenting the portrait. Joe. Justice and good afternoon. My name is Joe Borino and I was Marie Garibaldi's favorite bumper. <laughs> I just wanted to say a few words of thanks to Donna Anna Pete and your staff who were just fabulous during this entire process. Um, I'd also like to thank our assembled members of, judi of the judiciary, county officials, and other guests for coming here to help us celebrate this unveiling and courtroom dedication. I'd also like to recognize my co-clerks, especially Jim Flynn, Nicole Beers, Marjorie Adams, Judge Arleo, Judge Sabatino, Judge Diamadia, and all those who made incredibly generous contributions uh, during the course of our fundraising for the portrait. Now, if I may, I'd like to direct some comments to our assignment judge, Judge Bariso. You know, it's always nice to make a new friend and, and part of this project, I, I made a new friend and that's Judge Bariso. He is just a great guy, a great guy, a great man. And perhaps the, most, the person most responsible for today turning out as well as it has in this incredibly wonderful setting. Your Honor, it is my honor to stand here in this courthouse which bears the name of one great justice and son of New Jersey to remember another great justice and daughter of Hudson County. Her heart and spirit fill this courthouse today just as it did every time she walked through its front doors. So it is my privilege to be part of bringing you Paul Janice's wonderful portrait of the woman whose life has been so beautifully remembered today by today's speakers. A woman who has meant so much to so many of us for so long. May her portrait continue to be a reminder to serve with the same honor, grace, and dignity with which she served all of us and inspire us to recall whenever we come here all that she was and all that her example still inspires us to become. Therefore, Your Honor, from all of us, we present to you and to everyone who walks in this building simply asking for a fair day, our portrait of Justice Garibaldi.
Wow, what a magnificent, magnificent portrait. Thank you to all those who enabled this uh, to be presented here today. I'd like to call upon the Hudson County Executive, Tom DeGees. I don't know if the chair of the Hudson County Board of Chosen Freeholders, Anthony Veneri, is here, but I call on him if he is, and Hudson County Bar President, Jonathan Coles, and I want to express our appreciation in particular to the County Executive for helping arrange this program and for sponsoring the reception that will follow, and I am asked to put in a plug for the nonprofit caterer associated with New Jersey City University, Enhance the Block, that we will be able to enjoy in just a few moments. So I'd invite the County Executive to come forward and offer some remarks uh, about the courtroom dedication in honor of the Justice. Thank you. Well, welcome to the beautiful Brennan Courthouse. You know, I, I heard it mentioned a number of times today that Justice Garibaldi was a Hudson County girl. We like Hudson County girls around here, but more specifically, she was a Weehawken girl, a beautiful town along the waterfront. And with us today also is the mayor of that great town, Rich Turner. You know, one of the uh, nicest parts about my job is that I get to come to this beautiful building every morning. And it's a, it's a treat, and it's something that I appreciate and will never take for granted. And uh, having Justice Brennan's name on the, uh, the front of this building and referred to uh, often uh, is a, a great honor for us. However, it's also a great responsibility. It wasn't too many years ago that we're knocking down this building to make it a parking lot for a building down the corner that we actually need to replace. Uh, and so my message to you today is that to the family and the friends of Justice Garibaldi, we'll take our responsibility seriously so that her name, along with Justice Brennan, will uh, always be part of this building and this building will always be worthy of having their names uh, attached to it. Uh, I got a lot of th <laughs> thank you. Uh, freeholder Chairman Veneri was not able to make it, but Freeholder from Hoboken in Jersey City, Anthony Stick Romano, is standing behind me right now. Uh, I received a lot of credit for hel helping to put this together. You don't do anything in government without all three branches cooperating, and this was one of them. So speaking on behalf of the Board of Chosen Freeholders of Hudson County is Freeholder Anthony Romano. Good afternoon, distinguished justices, chief justice, and uh, our county executive. Having the honor here today, to me, is historical, representing the legislative branch of our government, because it takes the three branches meshing together to understand why this country is great. I've had the honor of knowing Judge Garibaldi as a young police officer, having to testify and, uh, in her court and talking to her uh, at different times. She was a wonderful woman, as everybody has said here, and she also was a mentor in giving gu guidance and advice. Advice. I was kind of uh, nervous one of the first times I had to testify, and she pulled me on the side as she seen me later on and said, no need to be nervous, officer. Just up there and you tell the truth. And I think that what says it all about uh, a distinguished icon and role model that the justice was. So again, uh, having her to be remembered here today in the history of Hudson County so that none of us will ever forget her contributions, again, to making not only this county, this state, and this nation great, but I think that says it all. God bless each and every one of you. Thank you for the honor again. Thank you. Thank you, Frida Romano, County Executive. Now, this is an interactive program, so here's what we're about to do. The courtroom that will be dedicated is upstairs, Please take the elevator, walk up the stairs. We're going to unveil the plaque, cut the ribbon, and then partake in the reception. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers for the beautiful, heartfelt words. And for all of you.